Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. One of the characteristics of time, as I understand it, is that rather than placing all of the cosmic creative activity at the very beginning of our story, every moment is an act of creativity, an opportunity for renewal, a portal through which we can glimpse the involutionary and evolutionary orbit as it emerges into being and diffuses into non-being, which makes every episode of this show an opportunity to do things a little different. And this week is one fine example. I've never opened this show up to a guest episode, but my friend Kevin Wolmut a longtime listener of the show whom I met in Santa Fe at the Interplanetary Festival last year and who has been a very active and engaging member of the Future Fossils Facebook group, has recorded his readings of two very interesting essays, both titled The Next 10 Billion Years. And because one of the functions I understand this show to perform is to initiate people into deep time thinking and the humbling majesty of our broadest imaginable horizons. It felt right to take the first ever submission for a Future Fossils episode and actually put it out on the feed. These are both excellent essays. Kevin is a very amusing reader and I suspect you will enjoy this as much as I do. Before we get started, I just want to thank Hillary Selden for leveling up her pledge this week on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Michael Garfield is where I put out all of the secret episodes of the show. I'm about to drop a bunch of early release episodes. The Future Fossils book club happens there every couple months. If you feel like you've been getting a lot out of this podcast and would like to show your gratitude or you just want access to all of the things, then uh, hop on over there. Help me reach my goal for this year of 200 patrons. We lose a few people every month and the cornucopia of backstage goodies only gets larger. Also, thanks to everyone who has been reviewing this show on Apple Podcasts. I've always assumed that this show's big moment will be long after I'm dead, but I do love the richness and the depth of conversation that happens when we find new people to bring into the listening audience, and every review brings in some new person who, for all we know, might have the missing key to unlock some potent new conversation we've been sitting on this whole time. Anyway, here's Kevin Wolmut reading The Next 10 Billion Years by Ugo Bardi and The Next 10 Billion Years by John Michael Greer. Stick around after and I'll share a few minutes of my reflections on these fabulous works. Enjoy. Three Views of the Next Ten Billion Years By authors Ugo Bardi and John Michael Greer Read by Kevin Walmut There's a time and a place for everything, and now it's time to contemplate deep time. You probably understand what deep time is, even if you've never heard a formal definition. Deep time is the far future, or also the distant geologic past, well beyond the range where we can be confident about whether humans have any control over events. Here in the present, we feel like we're living on the cusp of a great change. During times like these, it is useful to contemplate deep time, because it instills a calmness that counteracts the rashness and emotions when we get caught up in the scandals of the day. What causes that feeling of chaos and uncertainty during the cusp of a change, 
I venture, seems to be the knowledge that everyone will react to problems with their own unpredictable, scattered self-interest. Contemplating the far future and deep time reminds us that unifying forces exist which are larger than ourselves. For many years now, two articles about deep time have stuck with me. Each article takes as its basis the known science, geophysics and astrophysics, about what happens to the Earth in the very long term, during climate shifts and stellar evolution. Each article brings those lofty sciences very much down to Earth by describing what people and other beings actually experience on a logarithmic scale of time. So for a long time now, I've been meaning to record these articles for the benefit of my friends and anyone interested in deep time. It's a neat way of thinking about the far future. One of these articles was written by Professor Ugo Bardi. It contains both a bad and a good scenario. So that's two visions of the future right there. The other article was written by Mr. John Michael Greer, also known as the Archdruid. Links to these authors will be found in the metadata of this audio file and I will identify them here. Professor Ugo Bardi teaches physical chemistry at the University of Florence, Italy. His books include The Limits to Growth Revisited and The Seneca Effect, Why Growth is Slow but Collapse is Rapid. He blogs at CassandraLegacy.blogspot.com and ChimeraMyth.blogspot.com. Professor Barty first gained my attention with an interesting talk called Peak Civilization, The Fall of the Roman Empire, which discussed the work of Joseph Tainter regarding the collapse of complex civilizations. Professor Barty's Vision of the Future was published on Cassandra Legacy on September 9, 2012. The Next Ten Billion Years by Professor Ugo Bardi It is not surprising that we found the future fascinating. After all, we are all going there. But the future is never what it used to be. And it is said that predictions are always difficult, especially those dealing with the future. Nevertheless, it is possible to study the future, which is something different from predicting it. It is an exercise called scenario building. Here, let me try a telescopic sweep of scenario building that starts from the remote past and takes us to the remote future over a total range of 20 billion years. While the past is what it was, our future bifurcates into two scenarios, one good and the other bad, all depending on what we'll be doing in the coming years. The Past Ten Billion Years Ten Billion Years Ago The universe is young. It has existed for less than four billion years but it already looks the way it will be for many billion years in the future. Galaxies, stars, planets, black holes, and much more. One billion years ago. From the debris of ancient supernovas, the solar system has formed around a second-generation star, the Sun, about 4.5 billion years ago. The planets that form the system are not very different from those we see today. The Earth has blue oceans, white clouds, and dark brown continents. But there are no plants or animals on the continents, nor fish in the water. Life is all unicellular in the oceans. But its activity has already changed a lot of things. The presence of oxygen in the atmosphere is a result of the ongoing photosynthesis activity. 100 million years ago. Plenty of things have been happening on planet Earth. Starting about 550 million years ago, perhaps as a result of the Ice Age known as Snowball Earth, multicellular life forms have appeared. 
First, only in the oceans. Then, about 400 million years ago, life has colonized the surfaces of the continents, creating lush forests and large animals that have populated the Earth for hundreds of millions of years. That wasn't uneventful, though. Life nearly went extinct when, 245 million years ago, a giant volcanic eruption in the region we call Siberia today generated the largest known extinction of Earth's history. But the biosphere managed to survive and regrow into the Cretaceous period, the Age of Dinosaurs. Ten million years ago. The Age of Dinosaurs is over. They have been wiped out by a new mass extinction that took place 65 million years ago, caused, perhaps, by a giant asteroid hitting the Earth, or, more likely, by a giant volcanic eruption in the region that, millions of years later, will be called India. Again, the biosphere has survived, and now it prospers again, populated with mammals and birds, including primates. We are in the Miocene period, and the Earth has been cooling down over a period of several million years, possibly as the result of the Indian subcontinent having hit Asia and created the Himalayas. That has favored carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, by weathering. Ice caps have formed at both the North and the South Poles for the first time in several hundred million years. One million years ago. The Earth has considerably cooled down during the period we call the Pleistocene, and it is now undergoing a series of ice ages and interglacials. Ice ages last for tens of thousands of years, whereas the interglacials are relatively short hot spells a few thousands of years long. These climatic oscillations are perhaps the element that stimulate the evolution of some primate species, which have developed bipedal locomotion. One million years ago, Homo erectus and Homo habilis can use fire and make simple stone tools. 100,000 years ago. The glacial-interglacial cycles continue. The hot spell called the Eemian period, about 114,000 years ago, has been short-lived and has given way to one of the harshest known glaciations of the recent Earth's history. But humans survive. In Europe, the Neanderthals rule, while the species that we call Homo sapiens already exists in Africa. 10,000 years ago. The Ice Age ends abruptly to give rise to a new interglacial, the period that we call Holocene. The Neanderthals have disappeared, pushed over the edge of survival by their sapiens competitors. Climate stabilizes enough for humans to start to practice agriculture in the fertile valleys along the tropical region of Africa and Eurasia, from Egypt to China. 1,000 years ago. The agricultural age has given rise to the Age of Empires, fighting for domination of large geographical areas. The human population has been rapidly growing, with the start of a series of cycles of growth and collapse that derive from the overexploitation of the fertile soil. One thousand years ago, the Western world is coming back from one of these periodic collapses and is expanding again during the period we call the Middle Ages. 100 years ago. The age of coal has started and been ongoing for at least two centuries. With it, the Industrial Revolution has come. Coal and crude oil are the fuels that create a tremendous expansion of humankind in numbers and power. 100 years ago, there are already more than a billion humans on the planet and the population is rapidly heading for the 2 billion mark. Pollution is still a minor problem that goes largely unrecognized. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increasing to near 300 parts per million, 
over the 270 parts per million, which had been the level of the pre-industrial age. This fact is noted by some human scientists, who predict that it would cause a warming of the planet. But the long-term consequences are not understood. Ten years ago. The fossil fuels which have created the industrial age are starting to show signs of depletion, and the same is true also for most mineral commodities. The attempt to replace fossil fuels with uranium has not been successful because of the difficulties involved in controlling the technology. Energy production is still increasing, but it shows signs of slowing down. The human population has reached 6 billion and keeps growing, but at reduced rates of growth. The Earth's agricultural system is in full overshoot and the population can only be fed by means of an agricultural industrial complex based on fossil fuels. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been growing fast and is now about 370 parts per million. Global temperatures have been rising too. The problem of global warming has been recognized and considerable efforts are being made to reduce the emission of carbon dioxide and of other greenhouse gases. Today, The world's industrial system seems to be close to stopping its growth and the financial system has been going through a series of brutal collapses. The production of crude oil has been stable during the past few years, but the overall energy production is still increasing because of the rapid growth of coal production. The political situation is chaotic, with continuously erupting minor wars. The human population is now over 7 billion. The climate system seems to be on the verge of collapse, with a rapid increase in natural catastrophes all over the world, and the near disappearance of the ice cap at the North Pole. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now over 400 parts per million, and keeps increasing. The Future in Two Scenarios Number 1. The Bad Scenario Ten Years From Now In 2020, the production of conventional crude oil has started a historical trend of decline, but an enormous effort has been made to replace it by liquids produced using non-conventional sources. Tar sands, shale oil, and other heavy oil sources, as well as biofuels, are being produced in amounts sufficient to stave off the decline. Natural gas production is in decline, but large investments in shale gas have so far avoided collapse. Uranium, too, has become scarce, and several countries which don't have national resources have been forced to close down some of their nuclear plants. These trends are partially compensated by the still-increasing production of coal which is also used to produce liquid fuels and other chemicals that once had been obtained from oil. The growth of renewable energy has stalled. There are no more resources to invest in research and development in new technologies and new plants, while a propaganda campaign financed by the oil industry has convinced the public that renewable sources produce no useful energy and are even harmful for the environment. Another propaganda campaign financed by the same lobbies has stopped all attempts of reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. As a result, agriculture has been devastated by climate change and by the high costs of fertilizers and mechanization. The human population starts an epical reversal of its growing trend, decimated also because of the increasing fraction of fertile land which is dedicated to biofuels. 100 Years From Now in 2100, the human economic system has collapsed, and the size of the economy is now a small fraction of what it had been at the beginning of the 21st century. Resource depletion has destroyed most of the industrial system, while climate change and the associated desertification, coupled with the destruction of the fertile soil, have reduced agriculture to a pale shadow of the industrial enterprise it had become. The collapse of agriculture has caused a corresponding population collapse. 
now under 1 billion people. Most tropical areas have been abandoned because global warming has made them too hot to be habitable by human beings. The rise in sea level caused by global warming has forced the abandonment of a large number of coastal cities with incalculable economic damage. The economy of the planet has been further weakened by giant storms and climate disasters, which have hit about every inhabited place. Crude oil is not extracted anymore in significant amounts, and where there still exist gas resources, it is impossible to transport them at long distances because of the decay of the pipeline network and the flooding of the ports. Only coal is still being extracted, and coal-fired plants maintain electric power for a reduced industrial activity in several regions of the north of the planet. Labrador, Alaska, Scandinavia, and northern Siberia see the presence of remnants of the industrial society. Using coal liquefaction, it is still possible to obtain liquid fuels, mostly used for military purposes. The Earth still sees tanks and planes that exchange gunfire against each other. 1,000 years from now. The industrial society is a thing of the past. Human-caused global warming has generated the release of methane hydrates which have created even more warming. The stopping of the oceanic thermohaline currents has transformed most of the planet into a hot desert. Almost all large mammals are extinct. Humans survive only in the extreme fringes of land in the north of the planet and in the south, mainly in Patagonia. For the first time in history, Small tribes of humans live on the rapidly defrosting fringes of the Antarctic continent, living mainly off fishing. In some areas, it is still possible to extract coal and use it for a simple metallurgy that uses the remains of the metals that the 20th century civilization has left. Human beings are reduced to a few million people who keep battling each other using old muskets and occasional cannons. 10,000 years from now. Human beings are extinct, together with most vertebrates and trees. Planet Earth is still reeling from the wave of global warming that had started many thousands of years before. The atmosphere still contains large amounts of greenhouse gases, generated by human activity, and by the release of methane hydrates. The continents are mostly deserts, and the same is true for oceans, reduced to marine deserts by the lack of oxygenating currents. Greenland is nearly ice-free, and that's also true for Antarctica, which has lost most of its ice. Only bushes and small-sized land vertebrates survive in the remote northern and southern fringes of the continents. 100,000 years from now. The planet is showing signs of recovery. Temperatures have stabilized, and silicate erosion has removed a large fraction of the carbon dioxide that had accumulated in the atmosphere. Land animals and trees show some sign of recovery. One million years from now. The planet has partly recovered. The planetary tectonic cycles have reabsorbed most of the carbon dioxide which had created the great burst of warming of long before. Temperature has gone down rapidly, and polar ice caps have returned. The return of ice has restarted the thermohaline currents. Oceanic waters are oxygenated again. Life, those species that had survived the warming disaster, are thriving again and recolonizing the tropical deserts, which are fast disappearing. Ten million years from now. Earth is again the lush, blue-green planet it used to be, full of life, animals, and forests. From the survivors of the Great Warming, a new explosion of life has been generated. There are again large herbivores and carnivores, as well as large trees, even though none of them look like the creatures which had populated the Earth before the catastrophe. In Africa, some creatures start using chipped stones for hunting. In time, they develop the ability of creating fire and of building stone structures. They develop agriculture, seagoing ships, and ways of recording their thoughts using symbols. But they never develop an industrial civilization for lack of fossil fuels all burned by humans millions of years before them. 
100 million years from now. Planet Earth is again under stress. The gradual increase in solar irradiation is pushing climate towards a new hot era. The same effect is generated by the gradual formation of a new supercontinent generated by continental drift. Most of the land becomes a desert. All intelligent creatures disappear. There starts a general decline of vertebrates unable to survive in a progressively hotter planet. One billion years from now. The Earth has been sterilized by the increasing solar heat. Just traces of single-celled life still survive underground. Ten billion years from now. The Sun has expanded, and it has become so large that it has absorbed and destroyed the Earth. Then it has collapsed into a white dwarf. The galaxy and the whole universe move slowly to extinction, with the running down of the energy generated by the primeval Big Bang. Number 2. The Good Scenario 10 Years From Now In 2020, fossil fuel depletion has generated a global decline of production. That, in turn, has led to international treaties directed to ease the replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy. Treaties are also enacted with the purpose of minimizing the use of coal. The production and the use of biofuels is forbidden everywhere, and treaties force the producers to direct all the agricultural production towards food for humans. The existing nuclear plants make full use of the uranium in the warheads that had been accumulated during the Cold War. Research on nuclear fusion continues, with the hope that it will provide useful energy in 50 years. Even with these actions, global warming continues, and agriculture is badly damaged by droughts and erosion. Population growth stops, and widespread famines occur. Governments enact fertility reduction measures in order to contain population. Nevertheless, the economy does not show signs of collapse stimulated by the demand for renewable plants. 100 Years From Now The measures taken at the beginning of the 21st century have borne fruit. Now, almost 1% of the surface of the planet is covered by solar panels of the latest generations, which produce energy with the efficiency on the order of 50%. In the north, Wind energy is used, as well as energy from ocean currents, tides, and waves. The production of renewable electrical energy keeps growing, and it has surpassed anything that was done in the past using primitive technologies based on fossil fuels. No such fuels are extracted any longer, and doing so is considered a crime punishable with re-education. The industrial economy is undergoing rapid changes, moving to abandon the exploitation of dwindling resources of rare metals, using the abundant energy available to exploit the abundant elements of the Earth's crust. The human society is now completely based on electric energy, also for transportation. Electric vehicles move along roads and rails, electric ships move across the oceans, and electric airships navigate the air. The last nuclear fission plants have been closed for lack of uranium fuel around 2050. They were not needed anymore anyway. Research on nuclear fusion continues with the hope that it will provide useful energy in 50 years. Despite the good performance of the economy, the ecosystem is still under heavy stress because of the large amounts of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere during past centuries. Agriculture is still reeling from the damage done by erosion and climate change. The human population is in rapid but controlled decline under the demographic measures enacted by governments. It is now less than 4 billion humans, and famines are a thing of the past. With the returning prosperity, humans are restarting the exploration of space that they were forced to abandon at the start of the 21st century. 1,000 years from now. 
In the year 3000 AD, the ecosystems of the planet have completely recovered from the damage done by human activities during the second millennium. A sophisticated planetary control system manages solar irradiation by means of space mirrors and the concentration of greenhouse gases by means of carbon dioxide absorbing and desorbing plants. The planet is managed as a giant garden, optimizing its biological productivity. The Sahara Desert is now a forest, and the thermohaline currents pump oxygen in the northern regions full of life of all kinds. The solar and wind plants used during the previous millennium have been mostly dismantled, although some are still kept as a memory of the old times. Most of the energy used by humankind is now generated by space stations, which capture solar energy and beam it to the ground in forms easily usable by humans. Research in controlled fusion energy continues, with the hope that it will produce usable energy in 500 years. Humans are now less than 1 billion. They have optimized both their numbers and their energy use, and they need enormously less than they had needed in the more turbulent ages of 1,000 years before. The development of artificial intelligence is in full swing and practically all tasks that once had been in the hands of humans are now in the hands of sophisticated robotic systems. These robots have colonized the solar system, and humans now live in underground cities on the moon. The new planetary intelligence starts considering the idea of terraforming Mars and Venus. The first antimatter-powered interstellar spaceships have started their travel to faraway stars. 10,000 years from now. There are now less than a billion human beings on Earth who live in splendid cities immersed in the lush forest that the planet has become. Some of them work as a hobby on controlled nuclear fusion, which they hope will produce usable energy in a few thousand years. The new intelligence has now started terraforming Mars. It involves similar methods as those used for controlling the Earth's climate giant mirrors, and carbon dioxide producing plants that control the Martian atmosphere, increasing its pressure and temperature. The terraforming of Venus has also started with similar methods, giant screens that lower the planetary temperatures and immense flying plants that transform carbon dioxide into oxygen and solid carbon. That will take a lot of time, but the new intelligence is patient. It is also creating new races of solid-state beings living on the asteroids and orbiting around the Sun. With spaceships from the solar system now reaching a sphere of about a thousand light-years from the Sun. 100,000 years from now About 500 million humans live on Earth, mostly engaged in art, contemplation, and living full human lives. Nobody knows any longer what controlled nuclear fusion could mean. Mars is now colonized by Earth's plants, which are helping to create an atmosphere suitable for life. It is now a green planet, covered with oceans and lush forests. Several million human beings live there, protected from cosmic radiation by the planetary magnetic field, artificially generated by giant magnetic coils at the planet's poles. The temperature of Venus has been considerably lowered, although still not enough for life to take hold of its surface. The exploration of the galaxy is in full swing. Other galactic intelligences are encountered and contacted. One million years from now. Venus, Earth, and Mars are now lush and green, all three full of life. Mercury has been dismantled to provide material for transforming the solar system into a single intelligence system that links a series of creatures. There are statites orbiting around the sun, solid-state life forms living on asteroids and remote moons, ultra-resistant creatures engineered to live in the thick atmosphere of Jupiter and of the other giant planets. Humans, living on the green planets, have become part of this giant solar network. The other extreme of the galaxy has now been reached by probes coming from the solar system. Ten million years from now. 
The new intelligence is expanding all over the galaxy. The green planets are now the place of evolution tests, and the Neanderthals now live on Mars. Whereas dinosaurs have been recreated on a Venus where the planetary control system has recreated conditions similar to those of the Jurassic on Earth. 100 million years from now. Controlling temperatures over the three green planets of the solar system has become a complex task because of the increasing solar radiation. Mirrors are not enough anymore and it has been necessary to move the planets farther away from the sun, which is now the preferred system for climate control. The statites that form the main part of the solar intelligence now surround the sun almost completely in a series of concentric spheres. One billion years from now. The solar radiation has increased so much that it has been necessary to move the green planets very far away. One year lasts now as 50 of the natural Earth years as they were long before. But these are no problems for the solar intelligence, now just a small part of the galactic intelligence. The three green planets are three jewels of the solar system. 10 billion years from now. The sun has collapsed in a weak white dwarf, and all the planets that orbit around it are now frozen to death. The galaxy has lost most of its suns, and the universe is entering its last stage of expansion, which will lead it to become a frozen darkness. The galactic intelligence looks at a nearly dark galaxy. It is now the moment. The intelligence says, let there be light. And there is light. Those were two visions of the future from Professor Ugo Bardi, although his last quote, of course, harkens back, intentionally or not, to the classic Isaac Asimov story, The Last Question, in 1956. Ugo Bardi presents two opposite versions, the ascent of mankind, with mankind as a proxy and perhaps pinnacle of all other earthly life, versus the descent of man and, apparently, all earthly life with him. His visions are systemic as opposed to episodic. Developments are caused by and reflect off of other developments rather than thinking of developments having a single cause or being the consequence of a single person, choice, or event. This understanding distinguishes Professor Bardi from much of mainstream thought and analysis today and pervades his entire work. His visions are also monotonic in the mathematical sense of that word. Progress builds constantly upwards or else decay pulls constantly downwards. Most of us by now are familiar with predictions of that sort. Artificial intelligence, for example, will build itself up into a singularity, or Arctic methane will set off a spiral of heating that will engulf the entire planet. John Michael Greer presents yet a different option, one that is neither constant ascent nor irrevocable descent, as we shall see. Author John Michael Greer is better known as the Archdruid, since he served as head of the ancient order of Druids in America for over a decade. A prolific writer, he has published many dozens of books of both fiction and non-fiction. His areas of interest include economics, ecology, energy, and the occult. And as a practicing Druid, he is, of course, interested in the concept of deep time. He currently blogs at ecosophia.net and ecosophia.dreamwidth.org. The Archdruid often urges his readers to look for the trinary. When somebody presents you with a stark binary choice between two opposites, look for a third option, a space that doesn't fall between either of the two poles because two opposite extremes often do not cover all the possibilities. 
The following essay originally appeared on the internet at Mr. Greer's former blog, The Arch Druid Report. Mr. Greer has gathered his former blog entries into anthologies, by the same name, for sale by Founders House Publishing. This particular essay appears in Volume 7 of his collected essays. The subtitle of that volume is The Myth of Progress. And now what follows are the words of Mr. Greer's essay, which was originally published on his blog in September 4th, 2013, and bears the same title as Professor Bardi's article. The Next Ten Billion Years by John Michael Greer Earlier this week, I was trying to think of ways to talk about the gap between notions about the future that we've all absorbed from the last 300 years of fossil-fueled progress, on the one hand, and the ways of thinking about what's ahead that might actually help us make sense of our predicament and the post-petroleum, post-progress world ahead, on the other. While I was in the middle of these reflections, a correspondent reminded me of a post from last year by peak oil blogger Ugo Bardi, which set out to place the crises of our time in the context of the next 10 billion years. It's an ambitious project, and by no means badly carried out. The only criticism that comes to mind is that it only makes sense if you happen to be a true believer in the civil religion of progress, the faith whose rise and impending fall has been a central theme here in recent months. As a sermon delivered to the faithful of that religion, it's hard to beat. It's even got the classic structure of evangelical rhetoric, the awful fate that will soon fall upon those who won't change their wicked ways, the glorious salvation awaiting those who get right with progress and all the rest of it. Of course, the implied comparison with Christianity can only be taken so far. Christians are generally expected to humble themselves before their God, while believers in progress like to imagine that humanity will become God, or, as in this case, be able to pat God fondly on the head and say, that's my kid. More broadly, those of my readers who were paying attention last week We'll notice that the horrible fate that awaits the sinful is simply that nature will be allowed to go her own way, while the salvation awaiting the righteous is more or less the ability to browbeat nature into doing what they think she ought to do, or rather, what Barty's hypothesized new intelligence, whose interests are assumed to be compatible with those of humanity, thinks she ought to do. There is plenty that could be said about the biophobia, the stark shivering dread of life's normal and healthy ripening towards death, that pervades this kind of thinking. But that's a subject for another post. Here, I'd like to take another path. Once the notions of perpetual progress and imminent apocalypse are seen as industrial society's traditional folk mythologies, rather than meaningful resources for making predictions about the future, and known details about ecology, evolution, and astrophysics are used in their place to fill out the story, the next ten billion years looks very different from either of Bardi's scenarios. Here's my version, or, if you will, my vision. Ten Years From Now Business as usual continues. The human population peaks at 8.5 billion. Liquid fuels production remains more or less level by the simple expedient of consuming an ever larger fraction of the world's total energy output. And the annual cost of weather-related disasters continues to rise. Politicians and the media insist loudly that better times are just around the corner, as times get steadily worse. Among those who recognize that something's wrong, one widely accepted viewpoint holds that fusion power, artificial intelligence, and interstellar migration will shortly solve all our problems. And therefore, we don't have to change the way we live. Another, equally popular, 
insists that total human extinction is scarcely a decade away, and therefore, we don't have to change the way we live. Most people who worry about the future accept one or the other claim, while the last chance for meaningful, systemic change slips silently away. One Hundred Years From Now It has been a difficult century. After more than a dozen major wars, three bad pandemics, widespread famines, and steep worldwide declines in public health and civil order, human population is down to three billion and falling. Sea level is up. 10 meters, and rising fast, as the Greenland and West Antarctic ice caps disintegrate. Fossil fuel production ground to a halt decades earlier, as the last economically producible reserves were exhausted. And most proposed alternatives turned out to be unaffordable, in the absence of the sort of cheap, abundant, highly concentrated energy that only fossil fuels can provide. Cornucopians still insist that fusion power Artificial intelligence and interstellar migration will save us any day now, and their opponents still insist that human extinction is imminent. But most people are too busy trying to survive to listen to either group. 1,000 Years From Now The Earth is without ice caps and glaciers for the first time in 20 million years or so and sea level has gone up more than a hundred meters worldwide. Much of the world has a tropical climate, as it did 50 million years earlier. Human population is 100 million, up from half that figure at the bottom of the bitter dark age now passing into memory. Only a few scholars have any idea what the words fusion power, artificial intelligence, and interstellar migration once meant. And though there are still people insisting that the end of the world will arrive any day now, their arguments now, generally, rely more overtly on theology than before. New civilizations are rising in various corners of the world, combining legacy technologies with their own unique cultural forms. The one thing they all have in common is that the technological society of a millennium before is their idea of evil incarnate. 10,000 years from now The rise in global temperature has shut down the thermohaline circulation and launched an oceanic anoxic event. The planet's normal negative feedback process when carbon dioxide levels get out of hand. Today's industrial civilization is a dim memory from the mostly forgotten past, as far removed from this time as the Neolithic Revolution is from ours. Believers in most traditional religions declare piously that the climate changes of the last ten millennia are the results of human misbehavior, while rationalists insist that this is all superstition and the climate changes have perfectly natural causes. As the anoxic oceans draw carbon out of the atmosphere and entomb it in sediments on the sea floor, the climate begins a gradual cooling, a process which helps push humanity's sixth global civilization into its terminal decline. 100,000 years from now Carbon dioxide levels drop below pre-industrial levels as the oceanic anoxic event finishes its work, and the complex feedback loops that govern Earth's climate shift again, the thermohaline circulation restarts, triggering another round of climatic changes. Humanity's 79th global civilization flourishes and begins its slow decline as the disruptions set in motion by a long-forgotten industrial age are drowned out by an older climatic cycle. The scholars of that civilization are thrilled by the notions of fusion power, artificial intelligence, and interstellar migration. They have no idea that we dreamed the same dreams before them, being further in our future than the Neanderthals are in our past. 
but they will have no more luck achieving those dreams than we did. One million years from now. The Earth is in an ice age. Great ice sheets cover much of the northern hemisphere and spread from mountain ranges all over the world. And sea level is 150 meters lower than today. To the people living at this time, who have never known anything else, this seems perfectly normal. Metals have become rare geological specimens. For millennia now, most human societies have used renewable ceramic bioplastic composites instead. And the very existence of fossil fuels has long since been forgotten. The 664th global human civilization is at its peak, lofting aerostat towns into the skies and building great floating cities on the seas. Its long afternoon will eventually draw to an end, after scores of generations, and when it falls, other civilizations will rise in its place. 10 million years from now. The long glacial epoch that began in the Pleistocene has finally ended, and the Earth is returning to its more usual status as a steamy jungle planet. This latest set of changes proves to be just that little bit too much for humanity. No fewer than 8,639 global civilizations have risen and fallen over the last 10 million years, each with its own unique sciences, technologies, arts, literatures, philosophies, and ways of thinking about the cosmos. The shortest lived lasted for less than a century before blowing itself to smithereens while the longest lasting endured for eight millennia before finally winding down. All that is over now. There are still relict populations of human beings in Antarctica, and a few island chains, and another million years will pass before cascading climatic and ecological changes finally push the last of them over the brink into extinction. Meanwhile, in the tropical forests of what is now southern Siberia, the descendants of raccoons who crossed the Bering Land Bridge during the last Great Ice Age are proliferating rapidly, expanding into empty ecological niches once filled by the larger primates. In another 30 million years or so, their descendants will come down from the trees. 100 million years from now. Retro rockets fire and fall silent as the ungainly craft settles down on the surface of the moon. After feverish final checks, the hatch is opened and two figures descend onto the lunar surface. They are bipeds, but not even remotely human. Instead, they belong to Earth's third intelligent species. They are distantly descended from the crows of our time, though they look no more like crows than you look like the tree shrews of the Middle Cretaceous. Since you have a larynx rather than a syrinx, you can't even begin to pronounce what they call themselves, so we'll call them corvins. Earth's second intelligent species, whom we'll call seons after their raccoon ancestors, are long gone. They lasted a little more than 8 million years before the changes of an unstable planet sent them down the long road to extinction. They never got that deeply into technology, though their political institutions made the most sophisticated human equivalents look embarrassingly crude. The Corvins are another matter. Some twist of inherited psychology left them with a passion for heights and upward movement, they worked out the basic principles of the hot air balloon before they got around to inventing the wheel. And balloons, gliders, and corvin carrying kites play much the same roles in their earliest epic literature that horses and chariots play in ours. As corvin societies evolved more complex technologies, eyes gazed upwards from soaring tower cities at the moon, the perch of perches set high above the world. All that was needed to make those dreams a reality was petroleum. 
And a hundred million years is more than enough time for the Earth to restock her petroleum reserves, especially if that period starts out with an oceanic anoxic event that stashes gigatons of carbon in marine sediments. Thus, it was inevitable that sooner or later, the strongest of the great Corvin kith assemblies would devote its talents and wealth to the task of reaching the moon. The universe has a surprise in store for the Corvins, though. Their first moon landing included among its goals the investigation of some odd surface features, too small to be seen clearly by Earth-based equipment. That first lander thus set down on a flat lunar plane that, a very long time ago, was called the Sea of Tranquility. And so it was that the stunned Corvin astronauts found themselves facing the unmistakable remains of a spacecraft that arrived on the moon in the unimaginably distant past. A few equivocal traces buried in terrestrial sediments had suggested already to Corvin lore masters that another intelligent species might have lived on the Earth before them, though the theory was dismissed by most as wild speculation. The scattered remnants on the moon confirmed them, and made it hard for even the most optimistic Corvins to embrace the notion that some providence guaranteed the survival of intelligent species. The curious markings on some of the remains, which some lore masters suggested might have been a mode of visual communication, resisted all attempts at decipherment. And very little was ever learnt for certain about the enigmatic ancient species that left its mark on the moon. Even so, it will be suggested long afterwards that the stark warning embodied in those long-abandoned spacecraft played an important role in convincing Corvin societies to rein in the extravagant use of petroleum and other non-renewable resources, though it also inspired hugely expensive and ultimately futile attempts to achieve interstellar migration. For some reason, the Corvins never got into the quest for fusion power or artificial intelligence. One way or another, though, the Corvins turned out to be the most enduring of Earth's intelligent species, and more than 28 million years passed before their day finally ended. One billion years from now. The Earth is old, and mostly desert, and a significant fraction of its total crust is made up of the remains of bygone civilizations. The increasing heat of the sun as it proceeds through its own life cycle, and the ongoing loss of volatile molecules from the upper atmosphere into space, have reduced the seas to scattered salty basins amid great sandy wastes. Only near the north and south poles does vegetation flourish, and with it, the corbicules, Earth's eleventh and last intelligent species. Their ancestors in our time are an invasive species of freshwater clam. Don't laugh. A billion years ago, your ancestors were still trying to work out the details of multicellularity. The corbicules have the same highly practical limb structure as the rest of their subphylum. Six stumpy podicles for walking. Two muscular dorsal tentacles for gross manipulations. And two slender buccal tentacles by the mouth for fine manipulations. They spend most of their time in sprawling underground city complexes, venturing to the surface to harvest vegetation to feed the subterranean metafungal gardens that provide them with nourishment. By some combination of luck and a broad general tendency towards cephalization, common to many evolutionary lineages, Earth's last intelligent species is also its most intellectually gifted. Hatchlings barely out of creche are given fun little logic problems, such as Fermat's last theorem, for their amusement and a large majority of adult corbicules are involved in one or another field of intellectual endeavor. Being patient, long-lived, 
and not greatly addicted to collective stupidities, they have gone very far indeed. Some 8,000 years back, a circle of radical young corbicule thinkers proposed the project of working out all the physical laws of the cosmos, starting from first principles. So unprecedented a suggestion sparked countless debates, publications, ceremonial dances, and professional duels in which elderly scholars killed themselves in order to cast unbearable opprobrium on their rivals. Still, it was far too delectable an intellectual challenge to be left unanswered, and the work has proceeded ever since. In the course of their researches, without placing any great importance on the fact, the best minds among the corbicules have proved conclusively that nuclear fusion, artificial intelligence, and interstellar migration were never practical options in the first place. Being patient, long-lived, and not greatly addicted to collective stupidities, the corbicules have long since understood and accepted their eventual fate. In another six million years, as the sun expands and the Earth's surface temperature rises, the last surface vegetation will perish, and the corbicules will go extinct. In another 90 million years, the last multicellular life forms will die out. In another 200 million years, the last seas will boil, and Earth's biosphere, nearing the end of its long, long life, will nestle down into the deepest crevices of its ancient rocky world and drift into a final sleep. Ten billion years from now. Earth is gone. It had a splendid funeral. Its body plunged into stellar fire as the sun reached its red giant stage and expanded out to the orbit of Mars. And its ashes were flung outwards into interstellar space with the first great helium flash that marked the beginning of the sun's descent towards its destiny. Two billion years later, the gas and dust rich shock wave from that flash plowed into a mass of interstellar dust, dozens of light years away from the sun's pale corpse, and kick started one of the great transformative processes of the cosmos. Billions more years have passed since that collision. A yellow-orange K2 star burns cheerily in the midst of six planets and two asteroid belts. The second planet has a surface temperature between the freezing and boiling points of water, and a sufficiently rich assortment of elements to set another of the great transformative processes of the cosmos into motion. Now, in one spot on the surface of this world, rising up past bulbous, purplish things that don't look anything like trees, but fill the same broad ecological function, there is a crag of black rock. On top of that crag, a creature sits, looking at the stars, fanning its lunules with its sagittal crest, and waving its pedipalps meditatively back and forth. It is one of the first members of its world's first intelligent species, and it is, for the first time ever on that world, considering the stars and wondering if other beings might live out there among them. The creature's biochemistry, structure, and life cycle have nothing in common with yours, dear reader. Its world, its sensory organs, its mind and its feelings would be utterly alien to you, even if ten billion years didn't separate you. Nonetheless, it so happens that a few atoms that are currently part of your brain, as you read these words, will also be part of the brain analog of the creature on the crag on that distant, not yet existing world. Does that fact horrify you, intrigue you, console you, leave you cold? We'll discuss the implications of that choice next week. That was John Michael Greer's vision of the next 10 billion years. 
The essay that followed, a week later on Mr. Greer's blog, discussed how the recent generation of people seems somewhat more amenable to the concept that life works in cycles. The recent generation is less desperately invested into the idea that human life, specifically our human life, our culture, our civilization, and even our country, must endure forever and progress upwards. Some of his readers used words such as comforted, delighted, and awed when they read about non-human civilizations on Earth, and the prediction that their bodily atoms might end up in the primordial seas of a planet not yet even formed. On the other hand, after this 10 billion years essay was published, noted science fiction author David Brin, among others, logged on to John Michael Greer's website for the purpose of excoriating Greer's vision as too pessimistic. David Brin, of course, is famous for his inspiring Uplift series of science fiction, postulating that patron species of creatures have a tradition of genetically engineering other life forms all around the galaxy in order to improve themselves and pass the advancements of their civilization on down the line to eternity. So it is not too much of a presumption to note that David Brin appears wedded to the Ascent scenario, described in another variation just now by Ugo Bardi. Because Mr. Brin appears committed to the idea of perpetual progress, he could not accept Greer's vision that civilizations and even species have cycles and endings. Although that may be too glib a summary of Mr. Brin's position. In the ensuing rounds of comments, Mr. Brin appeared to prove, from Mr. Greer's point of view, the idea which Greer hinted at briefly, ten years from now. That those who are committed to the idea of perpetual progress are in fact capable of imagining that such progress can be interrupted, but only in the form of a cataclysm. In their discourse, they seem to see no difference between the idea that progress might not be constant and upwards versus the idea that we are doomed to destruction and misery. They're all in. There is no such thing as a steady state, not to one who takes progress as a sacred aspiration. And when someone discusses the first idea, that progress might not always be upwards, those who consider progress to be sacred will usually conflate that former idea with the latter, the idea of disaster. After all, surely we can all agree that Mr. Greer's scenario is far less pessimistic than Professor Barty's bad scenario, in which all vertebrates and plants larger than a bush are pushed right up till the edge of extinction. It is a frequent theme of Mr. Greer's writings that both the faith in progress as a constant ascent and the thrilling terror of the apocalypse we fear are similar to each other in that each, at best, are distractions, at worst, excuses, which too often prevent us from going outside and chopping wood for the fire and otherwise doing the hard drudge work of preserving our lives and our civilization for one more day. Thinking about deep time and one's humble place in it, it's good for the soul. But when we think too hard about micromanaging the far future, we tend to neglect our present duties, namely working in harmony with the ecosystem and the materials right in front of us. If you're staring out at the horizon all the time, well, that's when you trip over a rock. But a discussion of the sacredness of the idea of progress, as if it were a religion, probably merits its own podcast, some other day. Ugo Bardi presents two different visions, the ascent of mankind, with man as a proxy and perhaps pinnacle of all earthly life, and the descent of man, and apparently all earthly life with him. John Michael Greer sees time as a series of cycles and metacycles, Although no two are alike, they can often rhyme, as the saying goes. These are three very different visions of the future of life on Earth, all based on the same geological and astrophysical science which the authors, and most of my listeners, hold in common. 
The sun will expand and then blow itself out. This seems like an unalterable fact, yet the amount of time between now and then is so mind-boggling that surely that's not the only noteworthy component of future destiny. It's furthermore beyond doubt that both of these authors are aware of the role of random cataclysm in the history of life on Earth so far, and the same with David Brin. Neither author explicitly mentions the possibility of another world-changing meteor strike in the future as occurred 65 million years ago, or a massive solar flare, nor something like the Yellowstone supervolcano becoming active again. The odds that any of those things will happen during any of our lifetimes is minuscule. But as the years stack thousands upon millions to become billions, the probability increases. Yet each of these authors writes as if such a natural disaster would be a mere setback to their chosen shape of time, ascent, descent, or cycle. How do you, the listener, feel about the shape of time, having heard these two experts present their visions? Does time itself bind us irrevocably to the earth, and to a decline and passing away as all the other creatures of the earth, with whom we evolved alongside? Or is mankind's destiny something different? Albert Einstein's theories of relativity seem to imply that no two observers are likely to experience time in precisely the same way. What can we say with confidence about time itself in the distant past or distant future when there might not be any observers to witness it? And what about you, listener? What glimpses of the structure of time have you seen in your life so far? And what shape do you expect for the future? This recording has been produced under the terms of a Creative Commons license, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, version 4.0. In other words, you may copy and distribute freely and play this material in its original form, but don't change it and don't try to make money off of it. The articles written by John Michael Greer and Ugo Bardi were read with their explicit written permission, and all rights to that material remain with those authors. Special thanks and appreciation to the two authors and the musicians who have given me explicit permission to use their work. The music playing in my background right now is by the monster rock group Daikaiju, D-A-I-K-A-I-J-U, used with their permission. Daikaiju is well worth seeing when they come to your town, and they tour constantly. Recording courtesy of the Internet Underground Music Archive at archive.org. Other incidental music was created in part by me and in part by Evan Brow. Check him out at evanbrau.com. Thank you for listening. Keep on contemplating deep time and the things that are bigger than yourself. Keep up the hope that useful energy from nuclear fusion is only 50 years away. And remember to treat the crows nicely, because they will take over the Earth. After the raccoons are done with it. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this experimental detour from our show's usual format. I certainly did. Anyone who's been listening to Future Fossils for a while knows that I regard science fiction not as a form of prediction, but as a kind of rhetorical gesture, an invitation into a particular way of seeing, a space within which our thought experiments take on lives of their own. And like any non-equilibrium system, any evolving ecology, the conceits of one work of science fiction tend to beg additional new niches be created, new conceits. Every science fiction story I encounter seems to leave some important piece out, which creates a sort of vacuum into which new science fiction ideally will flow. And in the case of both of these stories, Barty's and Greer's, I think it's obvious how our speculative fiction tends to say more about who we are, the model that we project into this imagined future, 
than about the future itself. Since our present moment requires all kinds of people in order to perform the vast and ineffable collective computation we call civilization, it seems that a meaningfully complete, comprehensive understanding of the spectrum of all possible futures would require contributions from all living humans, that each of us carries some useful fragment of the hologram around in our heads. So I think it's important to note that as much as I deeply respect the efforts of both Barty and Greer to write these stories, and frankly, I think Greer's is considerably bolder and more provocative, and also that Greer makes an effort to give something more than just the either-or that Barty presents to us. I see a blind spot in both of these tales, both of which assume a kind of laborious gradualism in the evolutionary process and leave very little room for divine invasions, black swans, and other surprises. I mean, as Copernican as it is to presume that one day possibly intelligent ravens will invent their own civilization and space program, we're also not living in the 1990s when the notion of a self-organizing directionality to the evolutionary process was a little more hotly contested. And I think it's safe to say that in some sense, intelligence is an evolutionary inevitability So it's not exactly bold and shocking to suggest that someone else, possibly many generations of else's, will arise in our wake. And of course, they will be most likely insectivorous generalists, as that strategy seems rather robust through all mass extinctions. A perfectly reasonable position, given that in the collapse of food webs, Those animals that are most flexible, dietarily speaking, are the ones that will thrive. But the excluded middle in the stereoscopic image created by these two authors contains a reality that makes our imaginings of the next 10 billion years even more alien, strange, and unthinkable. Namely, that major evolutionary transformations, as have occurred many times in the history of this planet, tend to happen relatively fast and not through the gradual change of one organism, but through the symbiotic enfoldment of what were previously considered individuals into some new transcendent individuality. Talking about the dozens of times that multicellularity has emerged, the enclosure of humans, technologies, and ideas into the symbiotic superorganism we call civilization, Even the origins of life itself can be regarded as a kind of team effort by chemicals to understand and persist within the turbulent environment of early Earth. What I am suggesting here is that in neither case do the authors continue writing the story that is already being told by our paleontological record, namely a story of equilibrium punctuated by transformative and irrevocable self-organizing order in which everything that has come before is taken up into and becomes the parts of speech within a new living language spoken by the biosphere. So what does it mean for us to stop placing the intelligence of raccoons and corvids somewhere billions of years in the future, but to recognize the imminent approach of new forms of intelligence on Earth, building on the symbiosis established between humans and non-humans through domestication, an entelechy in which human, animal, vegetable, and mineral intelligences operate as the organs of a single awareness. It's as if somehow we have to continue thinking about this as technology and nature, humans and non-humans, rather than recognizing that we are part of an ancient process, one that does in fact trend in a recognizable and well-argued direction. Players in a story that might be told most simply as making the most of what's around. So if we're really going to ask 
about the next 10 or 1 billion years or even the next 1,000 years, really we're just continuing a legacy of colonial nonsense by giving apocalypse-obsessed, fossil fuel-fearing human beings the only voice in this conversation. Certainly it seems appropriate, for example, to invite the single-celled life of two billion years ago, survivors of the great oxygen catastrophe created by photosynthesis belching its waste products into our atmosphere, to tell us a story about how the creative intelligence of the biosphere steered directly into and through this crisis, using it as the resource pool and opportunity from which to create new kinds of metabolisms and new self-reinforcing homeostatic feedback loops that gave us the breathable atmosphere and the living soil we have today. If you've been following my Medium blog, you know that I'm in the midst of a book, How to Live in the Future, that's all about disabusing ourselves of either-or thinking when it comes to the future. And this kind of everybody-all-at-once thinking is nothing new to you. But for everyone else who's used to projecting their pet catastrophes into the so-called future, I invite you to contemplate the following. Excerpted from part two, the future is more of everything. Defining time as the apparent movement of relationships between entangled objects, space as measure of entanglement, time's arrow points to greater entropy, an isotropic, isomorphic cosmos in which every game has been played and all can come to rest at last. But en route to that final moment, entropy as evolution seeks the best fit path to oceanic stillness and contrives the paradox of order as a means to emptiness. The metabolic flurry of our intricate ecologies, no niche unoccupied. The fractal map of river deltas fitting neatly over our phylogenies and food webs. Winding tributaries and the tangled bank of Darwin's evolutionary wilderness take shape as the inevitable system seeking rest, its filaments forever reaching from the trauma of explosive origins to grasp at peace in full and evenly distributed disorder. Every action has its equal opposite reaction, though. The liberating march of progress, Eros constantly transcending limitation by devising and inhabiting more brilliant and adaptable new bodies, is actually the very definition of conservative, the conservation of momentum, energy, and information, as the cosmos rearranges its components to achieve a quicker peace by stepping on the gas and dissipating everything more rapidly. The answer to the ever-loving question of how order comes from chaos is that order is just more efficient chaos, an accomplice, not an adversary. Every tidy desk results in larger landfills. Every landfill is a mine awaiting artificially intelligent trash harvesters. The ecosystem that matures to weave together DNA and carbon nanotubule microprocessors in an Anthropocene beyond the oversimple categories man and nature is itself one giant dissipative structure functioning as an excretive organ of the sun as it assists in the accelerated burn-off of the Big Bang. So, two things collide to make a third. The third thing causes a more intricate relationship between the now three things that make a fourth. Each novel species finds new niches that are filled as soon as luck mutates a nearby organism up the slope of fitness to become a key to fit the lock. The whole thing drives itself. The ever-deepening complexity of Gaia just a crystal growing in solution, ratcheting up the double helix, just the natural consequence of radiating heat. And so it is that evolution tilts the narrative toward more of everything. We didn't leave bacteria behind when we got into bigger and then bigger huddles and then grew tissues, organs, spines, societies. We made a hundred billion previously undreamed jobs for germs to do. It was and is in that eternal and apocalyptic light infusing all of time a transmutation of the flesh. The simple taken up into the great complexity of something both ineffable and vast and unimaginably generous. No evolutionary layer left behind each one the platform for and beneficiary of the next. And when we fuse with our machines completely, we will not render humankind extinct, but will explode in our diversity to offer every variation possible upon the theme of human, most of which do not exist today.
In short, in some sense, it is hard to be completely wrong about the future if you say, this thing will be remembered and repeated in some way. A universe in which all possibilities occur is more entropic, thus more likely. And that makes the only certain thing that we can say about the future that it is and also isn't. Special thanks for this episode to Kevin Walmut, mindpodnetwork.com, where this show is hosted, featured patron Mike Schwab, and knowyourmeme.com, and every single person listening to this episode, no matter what species you are or what year you think it is. Thanks for listening. Feel free to write futurefossilspodcast at gmail.com, and have an excellent week. Let